Our Bible reading today is taken from John, chapter 13, verses 1 to 17. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around the, his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. For the Gospel of the Lord. Well, today we're going to be delving into that scripture that we read a little bit, which if you were here on Maundy Thursday, you would have... Um, you would have heard me preach on that scripture as well. But before we do, we're going to pray our prayer for growth. We're a church who desires to grow, and we know that the growth that lasts really comes from God. And we're not just talking about growth in numbers. We're talking about growing as disciples, growing spiritually, and also growing in ways that we can be a blessing to the people around us. And we heard today how we've been a blessing to the people at International Justice Ministries, but let's pray, shall we? God of mission, who alone brings growth to your church, send your Holy Spirit to give vision to our planning, wisdom to our actions, joy to our worship, and power to our witness. Help our church to grow in numbers, in spiritual commitment to you, and in service to our local community. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And loving Lord, as we uh, delve into this area today of mentoring and discipleship, I pray that you would open our hearts to receive from you. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Well, you get to that age where your children grow to the point where they uh, get their learner's permit and it's a great time. It's a wonderful time. One of the great joys of being a parent comes when your kids get in the car for the first time and you're sitting in the passenger seat. So exciting. Um, you know, it just makes perfect sense, doesn't it, to put your life into the hands of your 16-year-old son, <laughs> who's my, my 16-year-old son sitting at the the desk uh, doing the live stream today. Daniel, I don't mean to embarrass you. We have had a discussion about me talking about him. He did give me permission. But one of the things that's interesting about doing the driving lessons with your kids is that your relationship takes on a, a different paradigm. All of a sudden, you go from being the, the parent to the teacher. 
And it changes things a little bit because parents don't always step into that teaching role, do they? And uh, the dynamics of the, but the dynamics of the parent-child relationship don't change. They're still there and you're trying to do both. And it's really interesting because you start to learn things that you didn't know about yourself and it's a great, actually, great time to build a rapport and, and you know, get some good relational things happening with your kids. And, and the reason I talk about that is because I think it's a good illustration of what it can be like in a mentoring relationship in the church or anywhere for that matter. Because mentoring, it's not just about teaching. There's more to it. It's, it's a highly personalised endeavour in the same way that me t- teaching Daniel how to drive is a highly personalised experience as much as it is a teaching experience and a learning experience. And it's an important topic, mentoring, for us. We don't really talk about it very much in churches. And I've got to say, I don't think the bulk of Christian churches do mentoring very well at all. I think that's a problem. And that's why we're talking about it. Because mentoring is a facet of discipleship. It's part of discipleship and it's incredibly significant for us as we grow in our faith because Christian growth and discipleship is not an individual experience. It's not an individualistic endeavour. It's a community experience that we all share together. And I don't think the church puts enough time and energy and I don't think we do either here at, at how do we grow disciples of Jesus and teach them, and get alongside them, and encourage them, and give them opportunities to step in and practice their faith in new and meaningful ways. Maybe we think, ah, you know what, I just don't have the time. My life is too full to do that. Or, you know, I'd like to, but I don't think I've got the skills. I just don't know if I can. Well, you know, I, I think this is part of our culture. Our culture tells us that, you know, you should do what you want for your life. Do what you want for your life because you matter the most and do what's good for you and do it the way you like it. You know, we see this happening. It's not just the church, but I remember when I was um, involved in the local cricket club back in Bendigo, we had a lot of trouble getting volunteers these days and a lot of sporting clubs across the whole board find it very hard to get people involved because we value our time, don't we? We put a high priority on our time and what's good for me is the most important thing and this is happening in our culture. And, and, but we, we have to be people as Christians who are willing to give of ourselves to others to impart what we have to others so that they can step into things that we've already discovered. And I'm going to put it to you today that by yourself, it's incredibly difficult to grow spiritually. You know, some of you in this place are probably called to be a mentor. You have the skills and experience. And uh, the Lord has given you something to give away. And there's others of you in this place today that are fairly young in your faith and would like to know more and would like to know how do I step into serving or how do I, why should I serve or how is God calling me to serve? How am I becoming the person that God is calling me to be? And all you need is that one person who can get alongside you and walk with you on the journey. And this is what mentoring is all about. So, Which category are you in today? Because you're in one, whether you like it or not. Maybe for some of you, it's both. That's actually probably the best place to be, where you're mentored and you're being a mentor. Well, in our reading today, we see this incredibly intimate moment where Jesus is with his disciples and and, um, it's the last opportunity that Jesus really has to send a message or teach his disciples something. And to put it into context what what disciples are, let's, let's think about that for the moment. The standard definition for a disciple is a pupil or a follower of a teacher. And it's a bit like me with Daniel and the car driving lessons. 
But, but it's more than just teaching. It's, it's about observing the teacher. It's about seeing what the teacher does and then stepping into a, uh, the moment of imitating the teacher. Spending time with the teacher so that you can pick up the attributes or pick up the ways of the teacher. Jesus said, I am the way, didn't he? We talked about that. Um, we call ourselves Christians, don't we? It's a term that we're all familiar with. But it first was found in the Bible, believe it or not, in Acts chapter 11. And in Acts chapter 11, you've got Paul and Barnabas spending time with the disciples at Antioch. And it tells us there, it notes in the scriptures, that that's the first time in Antioch where the disciples were, began to be referred to as Christians. And that was in Antioch. And the, the Greek word is Christianos. Christianos, which is the putting together of two words, Christ, Tian, Christ, Tian, Christian. And the word Christ means anointed. And the word Tian means little, anointed little. In other words, little anointed ones, or perhaps little Christ's. Little Christs. So little Christs infers that we Christians are just like Jesus, right? How do we become just like Jesus? This scripture today, we see that these 12 men that are at this meal, this last supper, have been following Jesus for about three years' time, They've been, they're his disciples because they've been observing the things that he does. They've been observing the things that he says and they are taking it on for themselves and they are starting to adopt the ways that Jesus does and that he might do what Jesus did. They might do what Jesus did. And this is the last opportunity that Jesus has got to actually model something they can observe and to teach them something in the process. And you can just imagine the intimacy of this, because we know how Jesus is feeling. He is about to be betrayed. He's about to be handed over to be executed. And this is the last moment. Now listen to what he says. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realise now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Later, Jesus says this, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Very clearly here, Jesus is saying, You, wash, you watch what I do. You watch what I do and then go and do what I do. This is the, the mentoring relationship side. This is the teaching and mentoring relationship side of what Jesus is saying. I could say a lot more about that passage. I said a lot more on Maundy Thursday. If you haven't, uh, come along next year and I'll probably preach on the same thing. Um, the famous 18th century theologian and evangelist John Wesley he was very big on mentoring and discipleship. If you've ever studied what he was on about, uh, you'll know that he used to put people into groups. He'd call them bands and classes and societies. He'd put them into different groups so that they could do life together, that they could keep one another accountable and that they would grow spiritually as disciples of Jesus. And this became uh, known as the Wesleyan Method. 
to do these things with other people. And of course, we know that that turned into a whole denomination, the Methodists, right? So with, Me- with Wesley's method, he put them together so that they could um, keep one another accountable, to learn from one another and to put people beside each other that could mentor one another. Such a smart thing to do. And why, is it, why are we not surprised that that whole method caused the church to have a massive revival? The church grew because of the way, partly because of the way Wesley actually organised people into these groups. And he also had a particular way of teaching people that he would tell people, this is what you've got to do. And it's very, very practical. Number one, come with me and watch what I do. Come with me, watch what I do. And then after some time, he would say, now come with me and help me. Help me do what I do. First watch then help. And then after some time, he would say, come, come, you do it and I'll help you. You do it, you've seen me, we've done it together, now you do it and I will help you. And then he would say, okay, now come, you you do it and I'll watch you. You can see how that works, can't you? You come and watch me, you come and help me, you come and I'll help you, you come and I'll watch you. It's a four-step process of teaching people and discipling people. I think it's fantastic. And it's not rocket science. It's so simple, isn't it? But do we really do it properly? Do we do it well? I don't think we do it as well as we could. This method that Wesley employed, it's actually backed up by Scripture. If you go to 2 Timothy... 2 Timothy is a letter written by St. Paul to his protege, Timothy, someone who he refers to as his son. So there you go, there's that, it's more than just a teaching thing, isn't it? It's a relational doing life together. Come and work with me, come and see what I do, come and help me. Now you do it and I'll watch you. And this is what Paul is doing through his letters. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul writes this, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And these things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Did you pick that up? Did you pick that up? It's just like the the Wesleyan method in many ways. What he's saying is, Timothy, you've seen me do these things and you've heard me say all these things and you have them yourself now, so go and trust them to reliable people. Take what I've got and now trust it, entrust it to others that you can work with, that you know will stick with you, that you know are reliable. Go and do that. Who will then become qualified to teach others? others okay this is a bit like network marketing isn't it you know (laughs) but it's not it's about relationships it's not about a product of telling the gospel it's actually about life together and sharing a way a truth and a life amen that's exactly what it is paul first You've heard me, Timothy. Timothy, you have it. Now go and entrust it to reliable people. And those reliable people will become just like you as you've become just like me and they will go and teach others who we don't even know yet. That's how the church grows. We're praying for growth and we often hear, oh, the church is in decline. Oh, it's terrible, isn't it? What are we doing about it? Are we discipling others? Do we take the time and invest our own time to give it to others, to grow them, to give them opportunities? Do we hold on to leadership positions because we're the best at it? Or do we pass it on? Do we give it away? That's what the Bible teaches us to do, to give it away, to not hold on to it, to find someone who's reliable and pass it on.
you know, the church has all these growth strategies. You can read, uh, there's a guy called Barna in the United States, that big church growth fellow that has documented all these ways that and there's many, many theories of how you can make churches grow. And it ain't rocket science, it's right there in the Bible. It's about mentoring, it's relational. And uh, let's try this program, let's do Alpha. You know, let's, let's do the pray for, prayer for growth before every sermon. Surely the church will grow. <laughs> but as we've discovered, you know, we've put Alpha out there and for some reason, it's not working. Maybe that's because we can't find someone. In a whole world out there full of people, can we not find someone who is lost? When, all, when it all boils down, it actually is about relationships and our willingness to invest in other people and entrust them with the things that God has given to us. It's to do with people getting alongside people and encouraging them and teaching them and, and, and it's about giving of ourselves. Now, if... As I look around, I see a lot of people who I suspect are over the age of 40. Probably just a few in this room. And uh, I suggest, suspect that many of you over the age of 40 have been following Jesus for a pretty long time. Who are you mentoring? Who is the little lamb that God has given you to mentor and sow into? Some of you might already be doing this. And some of you might have one or two little lambs. I wonder as, as I speak whether people come into your mind that God is prompting you to get alongside. Because you've got something to impart. If you've been following Jesus for a long time, you know a lot. You're, you're mature. But are you ready to become even more mature and to get alongside someone and give it away? And there are others in this room who are young and they need somebody to get alongside them. To grow beyond yourself and to learn more about your spiritual life. And it seems to me that this is what Paul is telling Timothy to do, to impart what he has. And uh, I wonder what the Holy Spirit is saying as, as we talk about these things. Um, you know, you might be on parish council or you might be a ministry leader. Who are the people in your teams or around you that you're, you're, um, you're sowing into? If you are on parish council or, or you're a ministry leader or doing something in the church, you've probably heard me say it time and time again, we need to build a leadership culture in this church. And what I'm actually saying, to make it more precise, we need to build a mentoring culture in this church where we are giving away our position to somebody who's coming up underneath. Because if you have a church where there is this culture of mentoring and leadership and developing people, growing them in their discipleship as good, good Christian people, then the church grows. The church grows. But if that's not happening, the church won't grow because people aren't growing. We talk about thriving. We talk about thriving and we think about a garden that's thriving with all these wonderful plants, with all these different types of fruit and nuts and all these things. But how can they grow unless we're putting the nourishment into them and that the garden might flourish? This is why the scriptures often talk about, you know, planting seeds. And, you know, Jesus talks about these types of themes because... This is how the kingdom grows. It's a kingdom dynamic. And that's what we're trying to create here. We can't be people who well, just want to hold on and keep it to ourselves because we won't see growth. We won't see people growing spiritually and practically in many, many ways. You know, some of you, and I know myself, I've been associated with this place for a long time, um, before becoming the vicar and there are people who are buried out there in the garden 
who sowed into me. But they're gone now. So it's my turn now to sow into you. And I'm sure many of you here remember many people, saints of the past, who have sown into your life and helped you to become the person of God that you are today. Well, why don't you be like them and do the same thing for someone else? Find a young person or find a, an older person that's young at heart. I don't know. Find somebody and sow into them. Because you wouldn't be here unless someone had done it for you, right? This is what thriving mentoring and discipleship is all about. Um, we can't be a church that decides to keep it to ourselves because we do not grow. And if we do that, just decide that, that we're not going to pass it on, um, we are actually becoming a roadblock and we're denying, we are denying the next generation the opportunity to grow. And we can't do that. Do we want to be a church like that, that denies the next generation the opportunity to grow? No. Do we want to be a church where people find it hard to break into ministry roles? It's pretty hard to break in. No, we don't want to be that church, do we? Do we want to be a church where people think they're just not good enough, you know, not, probably not good enough to do that, not good enough to get up and be in the music team, I'm not good enough to be serving in worship on a Sunday, or I'm not good enough to get up and do the prayers, I'm too young, too young, don't have enough experience. Do we want to be that church? No. Do we want to be a sort of church where everyone says, I just don't really think I have the skills and... Don't think I have the time. No. I hope we don't want to be that church. I hope you're all sitting there shaking your head and going, no! You know, that's not what the church is called to be. It's not what we see demonstrated in the book of Acts at all, a church that's growing. So let's look at the other side of the coin. Imagine if St Paul's was a church where everybody was actually in a discipleship relationship with someone. Imagine if you were being mentored and you were mentoring someone else and that was happening across the board. I wonder what that would look like. Where everyone was growing in their faith but also practically growing in their capacity to bear witness to the gospel. And not just an intellectual gospel, not just the knowledge, but living it out and demonstrating it, just like Jesus served his disciples by washing their feet. Could you imagine a church where people, imagine the church if we were all learning to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. If we were a church where everyone was stepping into the spiritual gifts, the words of knowledge, the prophecy, the healing as well as the other spiritual gifts. Imagine what the church would look like. And imagine we had a church where everyone who had a talent or a, a creative gifting had the opportunity to use it. That there was a clear way for them to do that. Now, I'm going to tell you a clear way. If you've got something on your heart or you've got something that you think God has given you, come and talk to me about it and we'll make it happen. Okay? Could you imagine a church where people who are not perfect but are just trying their best get celebrated? Isn't that a good thing? Wouldn't that be a good thing? That's a loving church. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the church I'm looking for. Amen? Let me pray. Well, loving Father, we thank you that you are here, that you do love us, and that you are working through us. Lord, we thank you for the reality that, yes, people are growing here at St Paul's, and that you are using people to teach and mentor others. 
And Lord, it's our heart's desire to be conformed to the image of Jesus, the servant. Lord, we are imperfect. We fall short. But Lord, you make up the difference for us because you are good, loving and faithful. So today, loving God, we pray that you will work by the power of your Holy Spirit in and through each one of us. Help us to grow, Lord. Help us to grow deep in relationship to Jesus and deep in relationship to one another. And Father, all these things we pray in his strong and precious name. Amen.